So uh, thanks for everyone coming. This is the first uh, seminar or the first lecture in our seminar series on time series databases. Um, the reason why I'm hosting this the seminar series is because time series databases are the hot thing. All the new database startups are time series databases. So I have a big question of like, what's actually new? What's actually different? Why should we care? So that's sort of the goal we're going to have this semester of learning what time series databases are, are about. So someone's going to make money. Someone's always gonna make money, right? Uh, but Hopefully me. <laughs> the question is why, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, we're excited having uh, the first speaker today is uh, Paul Dix. He is the founder and current CTO of InfluxDB. They're a time series database company out of uh, New York City. And they're probably the number one time series database that we're, shows up on Hacker News. We're actually out of San Francisco, technically, is our headquarters. Okay, but where do you live? I live in New York City. Okay, there you go. Or on a plane. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's here to talk about Influx DB and he's going to talk about the storage engine and the internals of their particular system. So cool. take it away. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. All right. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, today I'm talking about the, the storage engine that we built. There's a whole lot of stuff with Influx, but today I'm focusing mainly on uh, a storage engine that we wrote from scratch specifically for time series data. So, InfluxDB is open source, uh, it's MIT licensed, it's written in Go, um, at least open source for a single server, basically. Anything that's single server, if it's focused on what a single server can do, it's in the open source. We have a commercial product that adds high availability and scale out clustering, um, but this talk is about the code in the open source single server stuff, so you can actually go check it out. Um, because this is the first talk in this series, uh, I figured I would set uh, some context first. What is time series data? What the hell? Like, this is how I view time series data, so I'm not sure what the other speakers will say. Uh, because I live in New York City, this is one that's very popular there. Stock trades and quotes, uh, those are, that's time series data, right? The raw event stream of trades is a time series. Here we're looking at the stock price of Apple. This is actually, we're not looking at all the raw trades, we're looking at a summarization of some underlying time series of events. We're not looking at much right there. It's supposed to be a graph. It is supposed to be a graph. Okay. That's fairly washed out. Yeah. I think it's actually the projector, but yeah, it's the projector. Yeah. We don't do yellow. Yeah, that's right. they're gonna redo this. So this is a big use case for us, which is metrics. Here we have a dashboard of some server metrics, application performance metrics. That's all time series data. Uh, I think analytics, user analytics is time series data, right? Those are event streams where you're counting things. Uh, this is a log from Apache. I've used this, view this as a bunch of time series, right? There could be 200 requests over time. There could be 404s over time. There could be requests to a specific page. You can basically break this up into a bunch of separate time series. Uh, and then sensor data, right? Taking readings off of physical sensors out there in the world. I view server monitoring and sensor data as very, very similar, where in server monitoring, your sensors are software sensors. And in this kind of IoT sensor data, it's actually physical sensors deployed in the world. So uh, for, for Influx, we think about two different kinds of time series data. There are regular time series, which are basically samples taken at fixed intervals, right? One sample a minute, whatever. Those are basically summarizations of something, right? Um, and then there's irregular time series, which are largely event-driven, right? That's, uh, if you have requests into an API, it could be the response time for the individual requests, trades in a stock market. Uh, the thing about irregular time series is that you can induce a regular one from an irregular one, right? So say you're tracking, um, uh, request response times and you want to say okay give me the min the max and the mean in 10 minute windows for the last 24 hours right you've created a regular time series out of an underlying raw event stream so when I first started this project uh, a question I got often was why why would you want a database for time series data like you know use a relational database put in a time column order by that duh um, but there are a few reasons. So scale is one of the most important reasons. Scale in terms of the amount of data that you're dealing with. So taking an example from server monitoring, 
say you have 2,000 servers that you're monitoring, which is a moderate-sized infrastructure um, with a number of people, right? You take 1,000 measurements per server. We've seen people taking anywhere from about 200 to up to 2,000 measurements per server that they're tracking. And you're sampling these every 10 seconds, right? So basically, you're talking about 17.2 billion actual events or data points per day. You wouldn't want to stick that into a table. Um, so, at that so basically, at that scale, like how you organize the data becomes important. Compression becomes very, very important. We want to be able to age out old data. So it's common in our use case to have high precision data that you keep around for a small window of time, right? Maybe seven days, uh, and then have lower precision data that are summaries of of things, right? So say you have ten second samples, and then you have ten minute summaries, and then one hour summaries. Um, online and fast, you keep all of it a bit someplace. Yes, all all of it online and fast. And the thing about aging out data, right? Like the na naive way to do it in a database would be like, oh, we're just going to delete every record once it's aged out. But what that means is once you hit your envelope of time that you're tracking, for every write that you do into the database, you're doing a delete. And that is a workload that really, really sucks for databases. So basically, the way people hack around this in SQL databases is they'll create separate tables for each like block of time, and then they'll just drop those tables to age it out. But ideally, your database system would handle all of this for you automatically. Um, so if you're thinking about stock prices, for example, but even stock prices. Yep. Usually, you think about like a debugging sequence. Things are going fine, something happens, now you want to look in the past and try and figure out what happened. Yep. So how far back you go, all of that information may become pertinent. So do you fault back in really old information because you had it in history record somewhere? In the future, we will. We don't currently in our architecture. And we, have, we do have people who keep all their data around for all time. Mm -hmm. And we have other people who keep like seven days worth of data. And they just drop all of it on the floor because they don't care. So, uh, so automatic downsampling, right? If, you're, if you want to compute summaries for longer term views of data, right? Say collect the min, max, mean, sum, and count automatically in different windows of time. And the other thing you want to do is you want to be able to do fast range queries for to return an entire series or to do a computation on, on a series of events, right? Get me seven days worth of data and give me one hour summaries of, of that data. So with Influx, it's actually kind of like two databases in one system. So the first is the raw time series database for, for storing time series data. Uh, and the other is an inverted index for matching metadata to actually the time series that we want to do computations on. So I'm, I want to do some preliminary intro materials to how Influx organizes data, or what, what the data looks like in Influx, because it's different than like a SQL work database where you have like a table and all this other stuff. So obviously everything is indexed by time, and everything is indexed by time and a unique series that you're tracking. We organize the data into shards, which are basically just contiguous blocks of time. So we want to be able to read a bunch of, because range queries are so common, we want that data to be uh, org organized like next to each other so we can do quick range scans. Uh, with InfluxDB, this is our this is like our line protocol. We have like this text-based protocol for writing data into the database. It is basically schemaless. You don't have to like create a table and define a table and its schema in advance. You basically just create a database and a retention policy, which tells which you you tell it how long you want to keep the data around, uh, and then you just start writing data in over an HTTP protocol. Uh, so the line protocol looks like this. We have a measurement name, which is a string. We have tags, which are key value pairs, where the values are strings. And we have fields where the keys are the field names. And the values uh, can be either an int64, a float64, a boolean, or a string. Uh, we're adding support for uint64 soon. Uh, and then finally, you, you have a timestamp. <laughs> Uh, now, we actually represent the timestamps in nanosecond scale, um, which we do have people using nanosecond scale timestamps, surprisingly. Those are, most of those are use cases in um, 
Like there are some people doing like stuff with quantum experiments where they're tracking time series data, and there's also uh, high frequency trading firms that are tracking nanosecond timestamps on uh, their network hardware. On a single node, that would be consistent, but in a multi node, you would charge us a lot more to get some kind of control over clock skew. That's right. Yeah. Well, and depending on the setups, like we have, we have one customer who has, I think, five data centers globally, and they have guaranteed less than 300 nanosecond clock drift across the five data centers. They shoot for less than 100 nanoseconds. So it's like basically like what Google has, the true time thing with Spanner. Um, Atomic clock. What's the difference between a tag and a field? Uh, so. What key value? Yeah. So. I'll get into this. Basically, this the the tags is is indexed data. So uh, I'll sh I'll show some queries where we actually break that up. So basically, the values of fields those aren't indexed at all, right? So I'll I'll talk about how it's actually organized on disk, so it'll make a little bit more sense. So uh, basically, like let's look at how we would store this data maybe in a key value store. So say we have a series which is just the string, the measurement name, the tag set, and the field name. We map that to some identifier. Uh, and then it's just tuples of values and timestamps, right? Ordered by time for the individual series. So if we had a key value store, we say we have the ID for series one, we have the time, and then we have the value, and then we have you know, a separate series two, time, and a value. And if we insert another one for series one, ordered by time. So the important thing is if we're using a key value store for this, uh, the, having, it being, having the key space be ordered is important uh, for this kind of organization scheme, which is what we used to do when we used other storage engines. Uh, so when we started the project, this, this is basically the model that we were going on. And we we're like, okay, many storage engines have this model. Initially, we used LevelDB, which is a log structured merge tree uh, out of Google. Um, so, and then we also tried over time, we tried RocksDB, HyperLevelDB, which are both forks of LevelDB, uh, LMDB, and uh, BoltDB, which are both copy on write memory map B plus trees. Um, so, none of them were giving us what we really wanted. So, in was it in the fall of 2015, we decided to write our own storage engine. Right, which uh, when I told like our investors and other people that we were doing this, they thought I was completely insane uh, because the the number I've heard is if you want to create a new storage engine, it takes about a decade to actually get it to the point where it's mature and stable and you can trust it. Five so, eight years, is what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the point is like first we tried LSM trees. And the problem with LSM trees were that deletes were too expensive. So then we organized, like we created a separate LSM tree per block of time, but then we ended up having way too many file handles open, right? For people who had very, very large databases, they'd actually just blow up their entire system because they'd have too many file handles. So like, okay, well, let's try memory map to copy on write B plus tree. Maybe that'll be better for us. But the problem is the write throughput sucked on that. Uh, it wasn't even close to what LSM trees could do, obviously, because LSM trees are optimized for writes. And for the time series use case, writes were very important. Also, we didn't get compression, which, again, for us was very, very important. So none of the like popular storage engines actually met the requirements that we had at the time. Uh, so we wanted to be able to get high write throughput we still wanted awesome read performance so that we could query in real time, right? We, people want to be able to query the database and get results in ideally less than 100 milliseconds because they're building visualizations on top of it so users are waiting for this data to return. Uh, and we wanted better compression. And ultimately, like writes can't block reads in, this, in the system. And at the same time, reads can't block writes. We can't have those things like locking things up. And we want to be able to write to multiple ranges of time simultaneously without it impacting the performance of the database. Obviously, hot backups are important. This was a big thing for us because LevelDB doesn't have hot backups. Um, and we wanted to be able to have many databases open in a single process without blowing up the number of file handles. So the storage engine that we created, we called uh, the Time Structure Merge Tree, TSM Tree for short. It's basically like an LSM tree, heavily inspired by an LSM tree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Trademark, <laughs> uh, but different. So the components of it look like this. We have a write-ahead log, we have an in-memory cache, 
and we have index files on disk. Right, so it's very, very similar to, LS, to LSM trees. Right? In an LSM tree, the wall's the same, in-memory cache is like mem tables, and index files are like SS tables. Uh, and just like SS tables, our index files are read, write once, read only after that. Right? Uh, so basically, going through what a, a write looks like, you know, write comes into the system, we have a write ahead log, we actually do an F sync so that we we're sure it's durable, it's just an append only file, and at the same time we write it to an in memory index. Uh, and then periodically we will flush the in memory like cache into on disk index files, what we call TSM files. And the other thing we do is that we memory map all of these files. So we can just access them like an array in memory, right? So the structure of the TSM files, these, these are the index files, looks like this. We have the five, five byte header that identifies what, what it is. We have blocks of data. We have an index at the end. And then we have a footer, uh, which tells us where, where the index begin is. So the header looks like this. We have the magic four byte string. And then we have a version byte. Uh, which we haven't bumped yet, but I suspect that we're actually going to create version two of this thing. We actually just started development on it like last week, so hopefully we'll have like an alpha of version two by the end of the year. Um, the blocks look like this, right? So you just have a collection of blocks. You have within a block you have the CRC, and then you have the data, the compressed data, uh, and then the index looks like this, right? We have a key length key, which is a string, right? Remember that time series key. Uh, we have the type because we can have different types. There are a lot of time series databases that actually don't support these all these different types. It would have made the task a lot easier if we say just supported float 64s, for instance, but unfortunately, no. Uh, sizes are all before compression. Yeah, this, so th none of this is actually compressed. The only thing that's compressed is this. This is where the compression lives. Um, so I think I have slides on that in a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically these are the byte counts you see are actually like all the actual on disk byte sizes, right? Um, so yeah, the type and then the count, the min time, the max time, and the offset. What's the, there's not a single event called time, or it's the min time, max time in the thing that's indexed. In the thing that's indexed, in the specific series, yeah, in the specific series that you're looking at. So for each series in in, in a TSM file, we know what time range of that series we have. We know how many values are in it, uh, and we have an offset in the file so we know where to go to the beginning of the series. Uh, so then finally we have the footer, which is just the offset of where the index is located in the file. This is also where you can like jump around this basically array. So we can say like, oh, well, let's jump to this series and read data. Let's jump to this series and read data. Uh, so here's what a compressed block looks like. Now, by default, we will compress up to a thousand values into a single a thousand values and timestamps into a single block, right? So what that means is even if you're going to read only one value from disk, like one t one timed value from disk, we actually have to decompress up to a thousand to get that. But in practice, most of the time, what people are doing is they're actually asking for a range, right? So we have the type, we have the length. And we separate the timestamps from the values. So uh, in the summer of 2015, Facebook put out a paper called uh, Gorilla, which is about their, their metric system. And they talked about their compression scheme. So it's basically, it's floats, and they use basically a double delta compression scheme that interleaves timestamps and the floats together. We were doing, th the re one of the reasons they do that is because it was designed to be in memory and append only. So. Technically, we're, we can do append only, but we also can do inserts into previous blocks of time. So we actually had to design our system differently. And because we were doing basically up to 1,000 values in a block, we wanted to separate them out because for many of our use cases, we can actually achieve really, really good, good compression on the timestamps. Right? If we know we're taking a, a value every 10 seconds, you can use run length encoding to compress 
like a thousand timestamps, right? You need a start time and you need whatever the, the delta is between those values. Uh, and then for the values, we use different compressions depending on what the data type is, right? So timestamps, encoding based on the precision and the deltas. Like I said, we store timestamps down to the nanosecond scale. So if people actually have nanosecond scale timestamps uh, and they're far apart, we actually can't really use compression. So we pick compression for each block based on the shape of the timestamps that we see. So the best case, like I said, is run length encoding. So the deltas are all of the same within a block. The good case, we use simple 8B compression. Uh, there's a paper by Anna Moffat that talks about this uh, index compression using 64-bit words. Um, and then the worst case is we just fall back to the raw values, right? We have to store the full 8-byte timestamp. So for floats, as I mentioned, we use uh, double delta compression. Uh, this is very, very similar to what uh, Facebook's Gorilla Paper uses. Uh, we have a fork of, uh, so like I said, our stuff's written in Go. We have a fork of a library created by Damian Grisky uh, that does this. Booleans are bits, those are easy. Uh, in 64 uses double delta first, and then if we can't do that, zigzag compression, same as protobufs. And then for strings, we just use snappy. Uh, we've been thinking about adding dictionary compression as something to the database, but we'd have to test to see like if we get that as like a win. You know, like if people are writing in strings where it's basically like uh, you know potentially like an enum of different states or whatever, we might get something better there. But we haven't tried it out yet. So. We're optimized for an insert only, append only read uh, workload, but you can write in a record. Basically, uh, the, for a value, you can view the unique key, the identifier as the series key, right? The, the string of measurement, tag set, field name, and the timestamp at a nanosecond scale. So only one, one value can exist at that specific combination. So if you write, a value in with the same key at the exact same timestamp, that's basically an update. We write those and then we resolve that at query time on the fly. Uh, so the updates can be expensive to resolve. And then later uh, that gets fixed up when we do compactions, which I'll talk about in a second. So deletes, this is very, very similar to LSM trees. We write a tombstone, we resolve the tombstone at query time, and then compactions later on go through and clean out all the tombstones when they rewrite the data. So, compactions, our goal with this, we wanna be able to combine multiple TSM files into larger TSM files. Uh, we wanna put all series points into the same file. So, uh, it's very, very common for, for for our users to have, say, like a million series that they sample once a minute, right? So basically, you're only getting one data point a minute in each one of those series, uh, which obviously, like, if we just, if we didn't, like, reorganize that data, we wouldn't be able to get good compression out of it. So the point of the compactions is to basically take all those different little bits of data from you know, those little individual points or maybe a few points and combine them together so we can get good compression and runs organized on disk altogether. In yeah. file systems, I call this dribble writes. And if you look at scans, you just keep enough memory around that you have a deep write back. But if it's coming slowly enough, you can't keep enough memory around that there's a deep write back. Yeah. And that's what makes it harder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I mentioned the 1,000 1, points in a block. Uh, there are multiple levels, uh, like in, in level DB, right? So there, you know, so we can tell like where where the compactions are and how far it is. Um, and the other thing I mentioned is, so the data is organized in what we call shards, like contiguous blocks of time. So if we had, say, a shard for today, uh, when it becomes tomorrow, we create a new shard for tomorrow, uh, and then we perform full compactions on the old data, right? Even though you can insert older data and historical data, the most common use case is that people are inserting data for now or very, very recently. So essentially four hours after a shard get, goes cold for writes, we will do a full compaction to try and get as much of it all together at once. Uh, so the query language that we designed for the database is basically like a, 
uh, kind of looks like SQL, but it's not SQL. It's like a mutant of SQL. Um, this is, we're gonna be changing this actually fairly soon. Well, we're still going to support this, but we are moving to a functional query language, which I believe is actually better for working with time series data. But talk about this. So here we're looking at the 90th percentile from CPU measurements for the last 12 hours from the Western region in 10 minute windows of time. And we're gonna look at that for each host. So basically we're gonna get a separate time series back for every single host we have in the Western region with this summarized data. So as I mentioned, the series key is just a string of the measurement, the tag set, and the field name. So the question is, how do we map these little bits of metadata to the actual time series under the, under the hood? So this is where the other part of the database comes in, which is essentially we use an inverted index. So most people are familiar with inverted index for uh, full text search, right? Generally, you're indexing a bunch of documents and you match terms that appear in the documents to the IDs of the documents themselves. In our case, we match metadata about a time series to the actual series, All right? So here's what that looks like. We have the series key. Those get mapped to some sort of identifier, right? Uh, so there's basically a lookup for series key to identifier. Uh, we have a, a lookup of a measurement name to the fields that are in that measurement. We have a lookup of a tag key to the different tag values. And here's another tag key to different tag values, right? And essentially then you just create like posting lists, right? So posting lists for the measurement, CPU, posting lists for host equals A, host equals B, region equals West. And if you have that, then when they do queries across like different tags and stuff like that, you can do things like intersections of the posting lists or unions, that kind of stuff. Just clarify, this term this arrow two thing, is that saying put it in this index and put it in that index? Just... No, 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 that's, that's just like me calling out what that thing is. Okay, so host, does this not say that host equal A goes in index one? Just... So this says, so basically this is, this is an array of of series IDs. So if, so say you're tracking memory from host equals A as well, and memory was like, uh, you know, there are actually many me memory measurements you would track, but just say you have one, and that series is, you know, series 23, then host equals A would have one comma 23, right? It would have the IDs of the series that host equals A appears in. And that's effectively getting you to a pointer to a data structure on on storage that you have indexes built for. Yes. Okay. It, it gets us a, to a point where we know, right? So if they do false positives model. No, no, no. So if they do, if they do this query. To do this query, what we actually have to figure out is we have to figure out what are all the series keys? What are the actual underlying time series that match this, right? So say we had just two hosts in this region, A and B. The series key would actually be CPU host equals A, uh, region west, uh, and then uh, value is the field name, right? And then the second series would be CPU, host equals B, region west, uh, and value. So we, we need to look up both of those time series to compute this. So, so that's, that's where basically the inverted index comes in is instead of document IDs, there's series IDs so that we can then jump over to those TSM files to look up that data. So, the first version of this index, which is actually what's in the production system right now, the 1.3.5 release of InfluxDB, is that this index, index is actually entirely in memory. Uh, it's loaded on boot from the raw TSM files. We look at those files, look at what series keys exist, and we build the index on the fly when the system boots up. Uh, the problem with this is that it's memory constrained. Uh, you know, the more, the more time series you have, the, the more memory you need to track all of this stuff. Uh, and the other things is when you have higher cardinality or a lot of data over time, it slows the boot time of the database, uh, which we've seen. So the index that we're building right now, uh, and this is not, 
There's like a preview release of it uh, in the current thing that you can turn on. It's basically a feature that you'd have to turn on. We don't recommend people use it in production. Uh, but it takes this and actually converts it into something that's disk-based so that we can, we can uh, have, basically we, it's disk-based and memory mapped, so we let the operating system handle what's in memory and what isn't, and we can actually jump around on the files to do these lookups. So here's what it looks like. Basically, the time series metadata comes in. Uh, we, we look, do we already have it on the on disk index, which I said is, is memory mapped. Um, if we don't, we write this new series metadata to a write ahead log, and we also put it in the in memory index. And then there are periodic flushes of the in memory index to these files of which we're calling TSI files, time series index files. Uh, so it, again, looks very similar to the structure of our actual TSM engine. Um, and then later there are compactions that happen to combine these smaller index files into larger and larger index files. So why MMAP? Why MMAP? Uh, because we just wanted to, we wanted to be lazy and let the operating system handle the paging for us. Could that lead to bad fragmentation of physical memory? You touch only a few things on a page? I don't know, actually. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> if anybody wants to help us figure it out. <laughs> what, figure out whether MF's a bad idea? <laughs> I've, I've heard this, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I want that on my grave. I want, like, don't use MF your database in my grave. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we, so we, yeah, we, we'll help you figure this out. Okay. Yeah. How, <laughs> if, if I die tomorrow, do this. Yes. <laughs> Put a plaque off. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so these these files are basically this is what a log entry in the right ahead log looks like. Um, the the index files are also uh, write once, and then there you can you can only read them. You can't update them. Yeah. Isn't, uh, I'm having trouble understanding something probably very simple, which is, so when you do this query, do you always get back like a pointer to an entire time series? Like, is there a concept of like a join? Like, I just want to find out in, you know, the corresponding data between two different series. Mm -hmm. What does the client have to do that? Or does the database do that for you? Just repeat the question, just show them the base. Yeah, so the, the question is, do, I, do you always have to get back an entire time series, or is there a concept of a join in the in the database? Yeah. Um, so, so by default, uh, so this. Oh, uh, hold on. Go back to this query. Here we go. All right. So here we have this query. Um, if I didn't have group by host here, yeah. and say we had two hosts, it would. The underlying engine would look at those two time series, but then it'd merge them together based on based on the times of the values, and then give you the 90th percentile value of the combined time series. Oh, it all so it runs one. It, it, this, if you didn't have group by host, yeah. it would return one time series. Now you're talking about the database engine, not the storage. Engine. Exactly. Yeah, that's in the that's in the database engine. Yeah. Yeah, so that, the query engine is a totally separate thing, and there's uh, in, we're building a literally building a new query engine now for the new query language, which is functional. Uh, and the way that looks, there will be other kinds of joins in that one. So, and why would you say SQL is not functional? Uh, so, well, this is, that's kind of outside the scope of this talk, but <laughs> uh, so the way the way the new language is designed, and actually there's a, I wrote up a very long like doc on GitHub about it. If you actually go to the InfluxDB repo, repo and look at like uh, InfluxQL 2.0, like do, do a search for that. Uh, but we're actually not calling it InfluxQL 2.0 because we actually have to support InfluxQL as it exists today. And so this is going to be a new language. But the way it looks like is it's basically chained functions so instead, it could look like Lisp if if uh, we wanted to do that, but it looks uh, like Spark. But Paul Graham and Rich Hickey couldn't make Lisp popular, so I'm not going to be able to. So basically, it looks more like a set of chained function calls, like kind of like you'd see in D3 or jQuery. So basically, like you have a function, 
And conceptually, it's you get a data frame in, it does something to the data frame, which is the, all the time series data, where the rows are the actual time series and the columns are the, are the times, and then you have the values along that axis. Um, and then you call another function, which does a transformation to that data frame and returns another one. So the construction of your answer is that the way to think about it is imperatively, not functionally. So it's not describing what the answer is. I've always thought of SQL as describing what the answer is. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll show it. I'll, I'll show it at the end of this talk. I can show an example of what I'm talking about with the new language. Maybe it'll make a bit more sense. Um, okay, hold on. I went too far. Okay, so the index file layout. <laughs> uh, so we have a series block, we have a tag block, a, a number of tag blocks. At the end of the file, we have the measurement block and the offsets. So this is what a series block looks like. You have a bunch of series keys. Remember those long strings. Um, you have a hash index, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, what that looks like. Um, and then basically you have fi file locations to see like where that series key is. Okay, so, so there's the series key. We see that there. We can go there and see the length of the actual key the key itself, um, and then the length of the next key, right? So basically we see offsets for where that key is stored in the file. Now, for the hash index, we use Robinhood hashing, uh, which I'd actually never heard about up until earlier this year. Um, yeah, so the, there's some nice properties for Robinhood hashing that make it actually really, really good for an index that is only going to be read from after you've constructed it. Uh, you can fully load the table, uh, and you don't have to have linked lists or anything like that for, for a lookup. And like I said, it's perfect for read-only hashes. So it looks kind of like this. Hopefully, I don't butcher this explanation. Um, so basically, I, what I have here are three arrays. I have positions in one spot, I have the keys, uh, and I have what's called probe lengths, which I'll talk about in a second. So in our example, say we're going to, in, we're going to insert A into our lookup table. So when we hash A, we get an index of zero. Whatever our hashing algorithm is, it doesn't really matter. We just want to know like where in the lookup table is A supposed to live. So we insert A into the table at position zero. Uh, and then next, we're going to insert B. Luckily, B hashes to one, position one. So we're going to insert that into the table. There we go, there's B. Uh, now, we're going to insert C. And in this case, C hashes to one. So basically, we have a collision, right? We have a collision in the hash table. So what we do is we actually write C into the next spot over. Uh, and then we mark that down. We mark the probe length of C as 1. So now, going forward more, say we want to insert D. And D hashes to position 0. So like, OK, we just ran into A, which is there. So let's go to the next one over. Like, oh, no, B is there. And we're at probe 1. If we were to insert it here, it would have a probe value of 1. But we look at B and it has a probe value of zero. So what we do is, since B has a lower probe value, we take out B, we insert D and mark its probe value, and now we're going to look for the new spot in the table to put B. So we go to the next spot over, we see that C is there, C has a probe value of one, which matches B's probe value, so B can't take C's place. So we're going to insert B over there, and we're going to give it a probe value of 2. So I think you know, the reason why it's called Robin Hood hashing is the concept is essentially you're going to rob from the probe rich, where rich is close to 0, and give to the probe poor. right? Uh, so what that does is you can actually have a hash table where you have an entry at every single point of the index, and you have certain properties about looking things up. How many, how far down the down the table you have to go to find a match for the thing you're looking up. So one of the refinements you can do is you can mark down what the average probe length is, right? So if you have uh, a hash table that's fully inserted, and you see that the average probe length is two, 
what you would do is whenever you hash a key to look up in the table, you would just add two to the, to the position. And then when you do your search, instead of just going forward, you fan out forward, back, forward, back. Can you quickly do the search. So you did the construction. But if, if I'm looking for D, do I D hashes to the first one? It's not there in its corresponding value zero. Yep. Do I have to run through all the corresponding values on the on the probe lengths to see if there's one of them that is within distance from the Right. So yeah, that's so that's not the point. Yeah, so let's do a lookup. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so we're gonna look up D. Now D hashes to we said the average is one. So basically D hashes to zero, but we're gonna we're gonna start with the one. So actually, the, the other thing I didn't note. That's the average. Yeah, because that's the average, right? So we're just gonna say whatever the hash is, plus one for the position. The one other thing I didn't note is you also keep track of the max probe length, yeah. right? That's super important. So basically, you're gonna search both directions until you hit the max probe length. Yeah. If you hit the max probe length, you know you have a miss. So the other thing we also do now, which we didn't when I was first making these slides, is we actually keep a bloom filter um, to try and eliminate Not looking at all. misses yeah, as quickly as possible. So yeah, so basically like D hashes is zero plus one, and we actually found it right there. So Z, we look up Z, it hashes to zero, that's not Z. So we move the pro we move it over, it's not D. We move it, that's not Z either. So we know we've hit the max probe value. Z isn't present in the table. Uh, so the other piece we have in the, this indexing stuff is the cardinality estimation. So people frequently want to know how many measurements do I have, or how many unique values do I have for this particular tag key, right? Like if host is a tag key, a great thing to know is like, oh, how many hosts do I have in my infrastructure? So we keep uh, sketches for cardinality estimation. Right, uh, and for that we use hyperloglog plus plus plus, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I have. Plus plus. What's that? What is the plus plus on hyperloglog? It's just like refinements on hyperloglog. Log. Okay. Yeah, plus plus is like a, a the newer one. <laughs> from the Google paper from ABG. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you look up hyperloglog plus oh, plus, plus, there is actually like a, a new paper that came out that basically refines. I don't remember the paper name, uh, but it refines the, right, the previous the, approach. The Other than the word, what is hyperlog plus plus? Hyperlog log? Oh, sorry. Hyperlog log, hyperlog log uh, was, <laughs> it's a way to uh, do basically counting of of a bunch of it's a strings. It's a sketch, yeah. It's an approximation. Um, so, and depending on how many, how many uh, bytes you assign to store the sketch and how big your, your actual key space is, you get different levels of accuracy in terms of what the sketch provides. And hyperlog log plus plus gives you uh, some nice properties on the accuracy of the sketch. Uh, and actually, we in low cardinalities, we actually don't use a sketch. We use a precise count. So uh, that's all I have on the storage engine stuff. I can. You actually have a few minutes. Do you want to show the, the preview query? Yeah, yeah. Let me. So how often do your users delete or update data? Update almost never. Delete, they sometimes do. For the most part, they use the retention policy stuff to just age out the data automatically. Um, but deletes aren't very common. Well, so aging out automatically means that when you look at the page, you realize that it's been deleted. There's not an entry put in there. No, the aging out automatically is basically like we're, we just drop the files. Yeah. Yeah. Um, inserting tombstones for all the items in. The no, no, no. That, that's why it's arranged in shards. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, like, if we have a shard per day and we're only keeping seven days worth of data, mm -hmm. once that shard is older than seven days, we just drop all the files and update the in-memory structure to say that shard's gone. Um, here, let me mirror because it'll probably be easier. Whew, this is going to be difficult. Oh, there's a bunch of reading there. Um, Uh, da, 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 da. 
Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have yeah I probably have a lot of tabs open anyway, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good good luck finding what I'm reading about. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me see. Do do. Go here. Oh, this is <laughs> gonna be painful. Uh, view. Here we go. Do, do, do. So actually, in the new our new data model is essentially we just have we're limiting the idea of a measurement name and a field name, and we're just going to have tags which identify a series and then values and timestamps. Uh, so here, let me show. Go down to some examples. Do do do. It's a lot of stuff. All right, hold on. And this is this is all on GitHub already. Uh, we hopefully will have like something. We already have something kind of functional. We'll hopefully have something that we'll release as like an early alpha to get feedback from the community uh, pretty soon. Oh wait, hold on! I forgot I intermixed. Um, yeah. It, it looks like the Spark query language. Yeah. Like yeah. So basically, like, here we go. Um, yeah. So say we're doing this. So basically, like, here we have we're selecting from database foo. We have a where clause, which is basically just this string in here. It's basically an expression where we can say we have those matchers. We have equals, not equals, regex match, uh, ands, ors, supports parens, all that stuff. Range of data. So we're looking at the last 30 minutes of data. We're going to window that data into 10 minute windows. And then for each of the windows in the series, we, we compute a sum. And then interpolate is basically like uh, insert values in the missing, in the missing windows. Um, and then in this case, this is basically an example where I'm doing a join to say calculate an error rate. So I'm joining on the host key, and the expression I pass it is I want to look at the errors metric and divide that by the request metric times a thousand uh, and return that as a metric. So people frequently want to do like these kinds of like transformations on the on the time series, and they like. Every time I was trying to like shoehorn some of this logic into our SQL style language, it didn't really feel consistent. And we did like we added like limited subquery support uh, earlier this year. And I was literally at a customer yesterday where they were complaining about how they it was hard for them to figure out what subqueries were doing and what the different syntax was. Whereas like this is like each function can be represented on its own is its own like unit where you know you have an input and you have an output and for function chains like this it's easy for users to see like oh what kind of data is getting returned at each, po each point along the chain right because when when users are like writing their their queries about the stuff they're doing most of the time what they're doing is they're visualizing the data in a dashboard um, so they kind of like fumble around to try and figure out like OK, like I, they conceptually can think of like the thing they want to see on the screen, but then they have to like try to like craft the query so they get the data and they eyeball it and they're like, wait, that doesn't look right. And yeah, so part of this is I, I think it's a more elegant way to represent like the things people are trying to do with this data. Uh, but I think it's also going to be easier for users to debug their queries to see what's going on at each uh, step. So let me see if I can show, I had like a, yeah. Yeah, so this is like, <clears throat> this is actually gonna be different. So, but say I wanted to get the 90th percentile, the max and the mean of the CPU readings for, you know, host A. It would look like this. What we're actually gonna do is we're gonna have a function called fork, where essentially, like you can view this query as a DAG, uh, where each function is basically a node in the DAG, and the data just flows down through the DAG. So fork would basically fork the DAG into you know n number of forks, 
where you say, okay, this is this source data here, and we know we want to get, we want to fork it so that we, on that source data, we get, you know, percentile, max, and mean, which is that kind of pattern is, is very, very common for the dashboarding stuff because they want to see like the band of performance for something, right? They want to see the high, the low, and the mean, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, is the answer. Uh, but um, so it depends on the shape of your data. So if you have a very, like one, like the, like the largest, largest instance on, on AWS, AWS. Uh, if you if you batch, batch, right, right, and you're doing like say 10,000 values per batch, and you have only about a couple hundred thousand time series, we can get close to a million values per second going in. Uh, that starts to drop down as you increase the cardinality. Because of the way the storage engine is designed right now, uh, we, we sort that those keys as we do compactions and stuff like that. So basically what happens is if your cardinality blows up super high, right now we see it probably around 20 million unique time series is definitely probably the upper bound for a single server. I would say closer to like 15 million. You can certainly have more, but then it affects your throughput and your ability to keep up with the throughput of, of ingest, right? So um, what we do, what happens is if your ingest rate is like, you know, you're trying to insert, you know, a million values per second across 20 million series, the flushes of the uh, write ahead log to disk will work for the most part, uh, or sorry, the, the cache, the in-memory cache to disk will work. Well, Actually, that starts falling behind because then we start like sorting. We, we, we block sorting those keys. Um, so the, there's a setting in the database for like the max, the max uh, wall cache size. And basically when you hit that, it starts rejecting writes. Um, so yeah, we're, we're doing some work to try and improve that, uh, which I think we can do because we're sorting the series keys where I don't think we need to. Um, and the other thing we're, we're gonna be doing is we don't actually assign series keys a unique ID at this stage. We store all the series keys on disk in those blocks and we're gonna be updating it to assign a unique ID to each series key. For a single series, do we accept data from different sources? Yes, but that is fairly uncommon that I know of, right? So um, if you have like a sensor out there in the world, as long as you have like the, the, the combination of the measurement name and the tag set should uniquely identify all the measurements coming off that sensor. Okay. So, and usually you're not, it, it, it's basically the only one sending that data, right? Even even if you're looking at like you're tracking requests to an API, like you could have you know a hundred app servers that are all serving that same API. As long as you put the host in the tag, you would those would all be separate series. Now you, at query time, you can merge them all together on the fly to get performance of your API across you know n nodes, or you can do it for individual nodes as well. They, timestamps can be out of order. Um, I guess it's it's optimized to for things that are append only and in order. Um, the most common thing we see is timestamps for different series may come in out of order, right? So for the sensor data use case, people are frequently transmitting data like over GSM or something like that. So they'll collect a bunch of samples and then you know transmit like once an hour or once every four hours. So those time series may be collected at different intervals than these other time series, um, but that's fine. The data database works really well with that. But there's no requirement that the time series are actually ordered as they come in. All right, thanks, thanks Paul. Thank you, Paul, again. Thank you. Uh, so next week we'll have Karthik from uh, Streamleo, which is the creator of the Heron streaming service at Twitter. So he's going to give a talk, same, same time, same location. I'll see everyone in a week from now.